So Jackie, good to see you. Happy New Year. It, it never fails to amaze me, the power of Formula One. This crowd. Um, we didn't have anything like this yesterday. M maybe it's you. <laughs> I, it, you're right, it isn't. <laughs> um, well, Formula, Formula One now is for sure the biggest television sport in the world on the basis that the Olympics and the Soccer World Cup are only every four years. So the huge Olympic viewing that we had was obviously bigger than a Formula One race uh, on a global basis. But if you think that from March until now nearly the end of November, there's a Grand Prix on every two weeks more or less. And that audience is huge. So the other thing is the general public are all driving cars now. The, the, the bigger numbers, for example, of women watching Grand Prix coverage is now something like 39%. And that never happened before, but there's more and more women driving cars. And keep in mind that all those countries that we go to, like India and China, uh, the Middle East, for example, that region, they're coming off the desert, coming out of the jungle into cars, which never happened before. So it's a very popular sport now. And of course, I think really more than anything else, television's done that. There's hardcore enthusiasts like many of the people in here, but there's an awful lot of other people who are literally armchair television watchers. And because of the excitement, and particularly what we've had in the last two years, it's, that's what's making it more popular. I, I think television's the biggest key. Do you think there are too many races? Somebody suggested, somebody well-connected yesterday said, there are too many Grand Prix, so we don't, we're not allowed to build up the excitement between races like we used to. There's almost overkill. Well, I think more for the mechanics and the teams. I mean, the mechanic, if there's any Formula One people here that work in any of the eight out of 12 teams that are in Formula One, they will know the pressure of time, the, the little amounts of time they see their family, their children, their wife, etc. And that's a bigger strain on that fraternity. And keep in mind that every Grand Prix, never mind the people at the factory, I think Red Bull are about 620, 630 people working for them. But they take to each race about 110 people. And 110 people going away every second weekend for a great part of the year, never mind building new cars, getting them assembled and being part of that, as well as being the race people, um, is a big strain. For television, I don't think it is. For the media, I don't think it is, because it's hitting all the time. I don't think we could do much more in the way... I think this year there may only be 19 Grand Prix, because there's a gap for one of them. I think Turkey's not going to happen. And there was, think, there was thought of a French Grand Prix coming back, but I don't think that deal's been done yet. But I think it's reaching close to the end. I mean, there's many more NASCAR races, for example. If you look at the NASCAR championship, the stock car championship in America, um, they've got more races than we have. Now, most of that's in the one country. But that one country is 3,500 miles across and a whole lot more up and down. So I think it's borderline. I think it doesn't need to be much more, but it's a lot better than when I was racing. I mean, one year I raced, there was only 11 Grand Prix. So that wasn't enough, obviously. But in your day, of course, you would jump into all sorts of different things. You'd race a touring car, you'd race a sports car, you'd go and do Indy. That, that sort of thing doesn't happen now. No, um, I, I think that there's a loss in that because for me, the challenge of uh, driving a, a sports car, a GT car, a touring car, a Formula 2 car, an Indy car, a Can-Am car, all in the one year, um, it meant an awful lot more work. And in those days, we were testing a lot. I mean, I, at the height of my career, I did all the Formula 1 testing, more or less, for Dunlop. And then when I joined Goodyear, I was doing that. The amount of time that takes out of a, a racing driver's life is considerable. We were, and in those days, because of the Ford engine, you know, it was so reliable. Uh, that DFV Cosworth was fantastic. You would do two Grand Prix every day, and you'd be there for a, a week or ten days using the same engine. That can't happen anymore. So uh, there's a lot of things that fall into 
making it more difficult for a team, but in my case, for the driver, I think I learned a lot more by driving so many different cars. I learned to work with other team principals. I learned to work with other mechanics. I learned to drive a small engine Formula 2 car one minute and a Can-Am car with 800 horsepower the next weekend. But it, it was exhausting because um, when I won my second world championship, I crossed the Atlantic 86 times in one year, 43 trips to America, because I was doing ABC's Wide World of Sports television. I was doing um, Can-Am racing. I was working for Ford and doing appearances, etc. But then I'd be coming back to drive in a TT in a, an Escort um, with Chris Kraft. And that was good because he was the man in a, at that time in an Escort. For me to have to try and keep up with him was quite difficult. Or doing the Nürburgring in a, a Capri along with Jochen Maas, who knew the Nürburgring probably maybe better than me, but knew the Capri, which was a dog to drive, uh, real fast, a dog to drive. Now, to come and try and keep up with, because Fittipaldi and I at that time, even up to 73, would go and do that. So it was a challenge. You got to be better with people. You were a better communicator. You, uh, you learned to work with different mechanics. You learned more about setup. So I think that many of the drivers today, frankly, have never had that experience and therefore maybe have re really reached their true potential in that respect. Some of them may well want to try Le Mans or, or do a rally or a touring car race, but commercial reality is they can't jump from one manufacturer who's sponsored by a rival brand and into another. No, that's true, <clears throat> but there's a lot of car makers not in the business of Formula One. So I, I think if a driver was good enough, uh, if he really was good enough and big enough, he could turn around and say, right, I'm driving for you in Formula One. Like Lewis Hamilton right now um, could easily say to Mercedes-Benz, I'd like to do three or four or five uh, DTMs, German Touring Car Championships. That would be a challenge for him getting in with the guys who are doing that. He would have to do it with Mercedes-Benz, but they're in it anyway. So therefore, I think if the drivers really wanted to do it, they would do it. But the problem is they make so much money out of Formula One right now, just their Formula One contract, that they don't need the extra money. When Jim Clark and Jim Graham Hill and Jack Brabham and Jochen and Francois and I were racing, we didn't get paid a lot of money for a Formula One contract. So we had to do other racing. Now my total income was pretty high uh, the end of my career. But I was doing an awful lot of motor racing. And I had to do that to earn what I would say was the potential of my window of time to be a, f a racing driver. Now, you can go and do other formulas. Lots of Formula One drivers have gone on afterwards to do Indianapolis and to do a lot of others. But while you're actually racing, I think it's good for you because there's no testing in Formula One right now. I mean, these drivers don't, and, and there's no young drivers being brought along where you would normally be using them in testing. There's just no testing in Formula One to try and keep the cost down. So a driver actually does precious few miles or kilometers in a year. So that, uh, I think the time that I was in it gave more satisfaction and learning process than the current racing driver does. There are some lovely images, and, and we'll talk about some of your cars that are here this weekend in a moment. Some lovely images of you and Jim Clark and Dan Gurney and Jack Brabham three-wheeling Cortinas uh, around Brown Satch. I'd love to see Lewis Hamilton in that, in the BTCC. I think he would do quite well. Yeah. I, I don't think he would have any trouble at all. Uh, I think any top driver can get in. No, it's, it's a challenge to take on you know, Plato in a, in a car that he's in all the time and you're just a guest 
performer. But that makes you drive that little bit better. And you wouldn't do it without agreeing you had so many test days. Uh, but but he would only take the ball a couple of bounces to get the hang of it. Um, and then I think you would, that would be, you would get bigger crowds coming to Silverstone or Thruxton or Cadwell Park or Snetterton if you had a Formula One driver doing uh, this series as well as his own. So I think it would be good for motor racing. And uh, th th there's, of course, a concern, are you going to get hurt driving in another formula and therefore you might be taken out of that team's big investment in Formula One? But some of the drivers go skiing. That's a lot more dangerous than driving one of these, I can tell you. Yeah, of course. Um, there is a wonderful display of nine of your cars, saloon cars, sports cars, and Grand Prix cars, just over there on the back wall. Do go and see it if you haven't. It must bring back wonderful memories for you to see them all displayed like that. Well, I haven't seen them yet. <laughs> oh, but, awkward. But, uh, there's, uh, I know there's the BRM that I won my first ever Formula One race on. Everybody thinks that was Monza, but in fact, the first Formula One race I won was the Daily Express International Trophy at Silverstone when John Surtees was world champion, and it was my first year in Formula One in something like, I think my fifth race. And I managed to win the race with John uh, finishing second. Um, so that's an important car and a very good car. It was the car I chose to start my Formula One career in rather than a Lotus or a, a Cooper or a Ferrari. Um, the Matra is there, which is probably the best racing car I ever drove. Matra made missiles. They did the Exocet missile. They did, you know, shots to the, you know, satellites around the world. They were a high technology company, and they made the best racing car I think I've ever driven. And then the Tyrrell, of course, it's there. The uh, first World Championship Tyrrell 003, and then 006. Uh, 006 was tricky to drive, but quick, and uh, wonderfully built, strong, robust, didn't break down, didn't lose wheels, um, not like some other manufacturers. So from that point of view, uh, I'm here rather than somewhere else. And of course, there's uh, the Cooper Monaco, the little sports car, um, the Lotus Elan, the Cortina, cars that you're not perhaps so well synonymous with, but cars that were you were telling me when we, we did the feature in Autosport magazine that um, they were crucial to your early career. Yeah, th that experience, again, is what I think makes a racing driver not just doing Formula One, doing all the other types of racing. I mean, when I started, to get my Formula One drive was unquestionably the year before. I drove 53 races and 26 different racing cars, um, you know, from a, a, an E-type, to begin with a normal E-type, then a lightweight E-type for John Coombs, but I was driving uh, Graham Warner's Lotus Elan, the checkered flag car, against the works Ron Harris. He was a half-works team, and Ron Harris was a half-works team, driving Cortinas, driving uh, Lola T-70s, driving uh, Formula 2 cars as well, um, that's everything else. I, I mean, I was driving Lotus Cortinas for Red Rose Motors right up in <coughs> in Cheshire, uh, in Chester itself, and then the works cars as well. So that made an awful lot of difference to the versatility of the driver learning. It wasn't just learning oversteer and understeer. I mean, the, the Cortina might have been the worst car I ever drove. Uh, the thing was never on four wheels, and, and that's what you had to do. Three wheels, you weren't going quick enough. Two wheels, you were just about getting it there. Uh, and it depended how many corners you did the two wheels on as to whether you were as quick as Jimmy or um, Jack Sears or John Whitmore. These were the aces. So uh, that type of experience was terrific. And... And then you would jump into a Lola T70 or something like that, which was a totally different car. So these were uh, the ways that I learned the trade, if you like. And the cars, there's a, an E-type up there, which um, my 
father had a wee garage in Dumbarton, and we became Jaguar dealers uh, because my, my brother Jimmy Stewart drove for Jaguar cars for a short time. And we had the first E-type that we got delivered was our demonstrator. And that's the one I took down to places like Croft and Rufford and Charter Hall, and we raced it. It's here. It's one of the cars, the red one. Now they've changed the number plate. I don't know why they've... It was one... What was it? FSN1. And now they've got something 300 on it. Um, it uh, your powers of recall are scary. We can't, we can't remember what we did last week. Well, I remember that gal over there. <laughs> oh, that, oh, yeah, that one, yeah. Um, let's fast forward to 2012. Um, be fascinated to hear your views on what was an amazing Grand Prix season. Are we spoilt now by uh, a richness of talent of young guys in, in the top cars? No, I think we can never be spoiled. I think um, to have, as it was last year, six world champions on the grid, there will only be five because of, of uh, Michael retiring again. Um, this I think it's the best group of drivers that we've had since the late 60s, early 70s. Because in those days, we had the same cluster. I mean, you had Jack Brabham, Jim Clark, Graham Hill, Jochen Rent, Francois Seffer, Mario Andretti. Um, Jackie Stewart. Uh, who? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, a whole bunch. I mean, I'm l Bruce McLaren. A whole bunch at that time were top, top racing drivers. It's taken until the last, I'd say, two years to be able to have on a grid that number of what I would call top, top performers. I mean, none of the ones I've just mentioned could you rule out from winning a Grand Prix. And that's what we've had in these last two years. It's, I mean, Red Bull for sure is dominated. Uh, and you would have to put that down more to the designer even than the driver. I mean, I think, um, I've said this many times, Sebastian Vettel is the most mature 24-year-old, he's now 25, I think, 25-year-old that I've ever seen in a racing car. I mean, the, the, the up he and this is where it works, up here. It's not on the backside, it's not in the hands, it's in the brain. He manages that brain better than any other racing driver with the possible exception of Alonso. But he wouldn't have done that at 25. So we're seeing that. We're seeing Alonso with probably the best toolkit altogether. The whole talent is he's probably the best equipped right now uh, as a human uh, to win. But Lewis, on a good day, there is nobody faster. Mark Webber, in a good day, is just fast as, as Vettel. Um, and then you take down all the others. Rosberg's up there. Kimi's right up there. Um, there's a whole lot of them who are capable of doing it. And that's great for all of us who, who are watching it. Because it's, uh, of course, it's down to the cars on many occasions. But we're seeing close racing. And I hope we're not spoiled. I hope we're going to see it again this year. Because everybody who didn't do as well as they should have done last year have hurt themselves badly, um, prestige-wise. So I hope this is going to be a good upcoming season. I must just ask you a bit more about Kimi Raikkonen because of your work with Jeannie uh, as an ambassador. How, do you, uh, how did you rate his comeback? Because I think in your day, if you'd had a radio, you wouldn't have been as rude to your engineer on the radio, would you? Do you think that's good or bad? Is it? Well, we, it we thought it was classic, but... It's, it's, it, 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 it's Kimi. <laughs> and you don't change Kimi Raikkonen. I mean, you don't change him. I, I, uh, I speak to him very seldom and a whole weekend because if he wants to speak to me, he'll come and speak to me. If I go and tart him up, he thinks, what are you talking about? Why, you, why do you bother me? I mean, I, I haven't done that, but that's how the reaction would be. He's a very special person person, I think the most special of any Grand Prix driver I can think of, past and present. But <coughs> his return was better than Schumacher's return. I mean, he was up there every single race that he was in last year. And he delivered. And there's no doubt that uh, 
the car is a good car. It was a good car last year. I hope it's going to be an even better car this year. But James Allison created a good car. But it wasn't an Adrian Newey car. So Kimi did extremely well. But with the knowledge and experience that he has and the mind management he has, he doesn't care about PR. He doesn't care about journalists or interviews. He doesn't want to do them. And he makes, you know, he doesn't hide that. And if you ask him a silly question, you'll get a very straightforward answer. So I, I like Kimmy a lot. And I, I can't count him as a friend because I'm not sure he has many friends. But the friends he brings along are pretty unusual people. So I think he's just doing fine the way he is. I, to answer your question in a way, we never had radios. But neither did we have 25 to 32 buttons on a steering wheel. And that's a new thing. Now, can you imagine a dyslexic having 30 buttons to press in order and go through? I can just see myself on the, on the phone. What buttons are? Is it, what's left and what's right, first of all? Maybe up and below is easy. But it, it's... It's a whole new thing, and uh, sometimes in certain circuits, and this is where the division has taken a stronger role from, let's say, past years to today. A uh, Formula One driver today could be just under 20% of the lap driving with one hand because he's, he's putting in what he's being asked to put in for further information for the team, for their telemetry, etc. So at least, at least about 15% of the time, he's got one hand on the steering wheel. Oh, well, he's got both hands on the steering wheel, but one doing the work and the other one pressing the buttons. Mm. 